Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we are talking about the way out of fear. This conversation was inspired by a workshop that Robert and I hosted over the weekend, also called The Way Out of Fear, which you can find in the Circle's bookstore if you want a deeper dive on this topic. And we wanted to talk about fear because it's not hard to see all the ways in which fear is present in our lives and in our world. Fear is a primal emotion. We are biologically hardwired to respond to it. But these days, it seems we are suffocating from it. We are so afraid within our personal lives, afraid of being sick, afraid of being abandoned, afraid of not being financially secure enough, and on and on it goes. But on top of that, at a societal level, fear is constantly being fanned to get us to buy things that we don't need, to take more pills and supplements, to stay glued to the news, to vote for certain candidates, and worst of all, to be suspicious of one another. And so individually and collectively, we are in a very bad spot when it comes to fear. And so again, that is why we wanted to talk about it today. Robert, I should start by saying that your process of workshop preparation is to do word studies where you look up references to the topic that we're covering and then try and piece together the big picture of what the course is trying to say. And it's worth noting that this was the largest word study that you have completed to date. There are just under 1,600 references to fear and related words such as afraid, frightening, terrifying, terror, and so on. And it's quite an accomplishment to have gone through all of those. Uh, I, I would feel sorry for you, but for the fact that I know you secretly love it. And so as we get started here, is there anything that you want to say about what you learned personally from pulling together all of those references to fear in the course? Mm. Well, I learned a huge amount, both theoretically and personally. I'm so glad I did that because you get the sense of what the course is really emphasizing, what the main message is, what the components are. But on a personal level, I, I think it just really brought home how much we can't let fear drift across, you know, the our vision um, as we just do all day. We need to watch out for it. We need to notice and say, this is fear. And we need to do the practices the course has taught us because it's not going to go away on its own. Mm -hmm. It's only so. So what I got out of it was really that huge focus on mind training, the need to face it and train the mind to dispel it. Yeah, and we're going to get into all of that as we go through our discussion today. One thing that stood out for me is, well, two things really. One is that the course paints such a unique picture of what fear is and how to dispel it something that we haven't seen anywhere else. And also it's a difficult picture to take in. The course has a very complicated, well, it's not complicated. The course has just a, a hard message to swallow about what is ultimately causing our fear. And so if we're going to get the most out of what the course has to teach us, then as students, we really have to be willing to reckon with things that we'd rather not look at. If the course is right about, about what fear really comes from, then it's a message that we have almost all collectively agreed to, to leave. Avoid. You know, to, to <laughs> avoid. Yeah. So, so the most, you know, sort of unconscious of us all the way up to the, our most conscious and educated teachers, there's a collective agreement to stay away from this view of fear. Yeah, before we get into what the course has to say about fear, I feel like we may have scared people already, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's worth going into the promise that the course holds out in relation to fear. The course promises that we can go through the world 
free of fear. It promises that we can live with the confidence that comes from what the course describes as a happy heart that beats in hope and doesn't pound in fear. And the course also promises that we can have a quiet mind because we're not constantly looking out into the world and seeing a place that is guilty and sinful and giving us all kinds of reasons to be afraid. And so it's a, it's a beautiful picture. I mean, the course asks us again, to, to look at things that we might not want to look at, to reckon with things that we, we are often unprepared to reckon with, but the promise that it holds, if we do that is very beautiful. Yeah, such an important point because otherwise we're just going to think, oh my gosh, this is too bitter of a pill and I'm not going to go there. Yeah. So let's start with just a very simple definition of fear, how we view fear conventionally. I just found a definition online. Fear is the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain or a threat. And that sums it up really well, I think. The, mm -hmm. But the the problem is everything in our world appears to be a threat. <laughs> so, yeah. So when everything's a threat, we're constantly living in fear. And so in our workshop, we went through this exercise where we listed all kinds of conventional things that we're afraid of, things like not having enough money, death of ourselves or a loved one getting sick or someone that we love becoming sick getting hurt, um, being in pain, COVID, germs. And then it, there's also things like we're afraid of being shamed. We're afraid of rejection, failure, abandonment. Um, we're afraid of the future. We're afraid of the past, all of it. So we have all kinds of reasons to be afraid. And, and what was interesting about that exercise is we asked people to check off, do any of these things relate to you? And so many people checked off all of them and it was yeah. quite a comprehensive list. It's amazing how long that list can go. I mean, there was an old, I believe an old Frank Zappa song about the dangerous kitchen. Think about how many things that you have to be at least somewhat cautious and maybe a bit afraid about in the kitchen. It's amazing. Right. Right. And then, and that's just the kitchen. There are that's all kinds of kitchen. other rooms right. in the house <laughs> and, and every relationship that we're in has its own fear. And, and again, the world's giving us so many reasons to be afraid. And so we're just really swimming in, in fear and fear is a central topic to a course in miracles, obviously with 1600 references to it. Um, when it comes to the conventional approach to fear, we tend to think that if we just claim our power enough that we can overcome fear, that's what we tend to hear. But the course has a very, very different approach to it. So can you walk us through what the course has to say about fear and why we're mm. afraid? Oh my gosh, this is such a, a huge topic. Where, where do you want me to start? The course says that we try and deal with fear in a lot of different ways. And so maybe let's touch on some of, of the ways that the course says that we try to deal with fear. I mentioned just a moment ago that we often try and um, overcome our fears by like claiming our power, by inflating our sense of self so we feel like we can get fear under control. But that's just one of many ways that we try and deal with our fear. The course lists many others. So let's get into some of those. Sure. Yeah. I think it's really insightful that the course does list the one you said where we have, it says an inflated sense of self that holds in darkness, like in the unconscious, what we really feel, the insecurity and weakness we really feel. Um, obviously, one of the big ones, I think, perhaps the biggest one is defense. We defend ourselves against all the threats out there. It's not just interpersonal threats. It's all kinds of threats that we're constantly defending against. The course says that planning is a defense against external threats. Another big one is we, we the course says we try to master our fear, which means we overcome it. We are bigger than it. And so we can keep it in a small little compartment and we can feel the fear and do it anyway. Another one the course talks about is just sheer avoidance. Like you just avoid the situations that make you afraid. 
which is, you know, sometimes it's not a bad strategy. Stop it. Um, You're only saying that because that's <laughs> your go-to. Another one, I'm not going to comment. Another one is that the course mentions a lot is we minimize how afraid we are. We, we don't face the full extent of it. We tell ourselves there's not enough fear there to bother with. Anyway, um, I collected 10 different ways, conventional ways we deal with fear. And, and you read through them and you think, yeah, yeah, I do that. Yeah. Number one, you're not commenting because you're avoiding. And number two, <laughs> one of the other um, ways in which the course says that we avoid dealing, or, or actually we try and handle our fear is by putting ourselves to sleep, by numbing or distracting ourselves. And I think that's a big one for so many of us as well. And it's a form of avoidance. We, we, are constantly on our phones all the way up to addictions, although constantly being on our phones is its own addiction. Mm -hmm. But we try and deal with our fear so much by checking out. Oh, yeah, that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, you know, I mean, we, what the course says about it has critiques of all of these ways of dealing with our fears. But if you add them all up, the big thing is that we assume that the fear is real that it is caused in us by outside forces. Those forces just reach inside of us and almost like with a hypodermic needle inject fear into us. So we have to feel it and then we have to deal with it as if it were being really instilled in us from the outside. And this is a fundamental difference uh, with the course because the course says that nothing directly causes fear in us. It's our interpretation of something. It's our belief about something. It's our picture of reality. That's what causes the fear. And so we are causing fear ourselves through choosing a picture of things, an interpretation of things that is the actual direct cause of fear. And so the course's whole approach is for us to identify those thoughts, those beliefs that cause fear, and then make a different choice, adopt what it considers to be a true view of things. And in that true view, there is no fear. So mm -hmm. that is a huge difference rather than dealing with it like it's real. And we have to, you know, throw around the hot potato. Um, you know, we realize there is no potato. So to speak. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a big point that the, we tend to think that our fear is coming from outside of us. We're afraid because the world and other people in the world give us all kinds of reasons to be afraid. And the that's really, the course echoes that idea that, that the apparent cause of our fear is that the world is attacking us. And so do you want to say more about that? Yeah, one of the things that came up in the workshop was, was people were saying, well, hang on, what if you've really been attacked? And the course is, you know, it's not a pie in the sky philosophy. It knows how things work down here. It knows we're all getting attacked, right? It says the world attacks and will attack again. Um, it talks about how every day a um, hundred little things make small assaults upon you. So we are, we are apparently getting attacked all the time. And the course knows that it provides remedies to see those things differently and to realize we don't need to be afraid of them. Um, what the course would say though, is that those things aren't actually threats to us. They don't, they, they aren't the actual direct cause of our fear. It's how we see them. It's our picture of things that is the direct cause of our fear. In fact, what the course says is that we wouldn't perceive all the things happening out there. Sometimes those things are attacking bodies, right? Attacking us. We wouldn't see all of that as carrying a real threat, justifying real fear, unless we were projecting onto it something from inside of us. And so the Course says the deeper cause of our fear than just the stuff out there, you know, which we think is the cause, is something in us. And what it says is that deeper cause is the attack in us. And that we, and this is 
part of the course's very challenging message, but ultimately I think very liberating message. We are afraid of the attack in us. From the course's standpoint, we were all created as holy, as purely loving. And so for a holy and divine being to look within and see attack in itself is scary. Um, and so from the course's standpoint, we are terrified of that monster in us. And to get rid of it, we project it onto the world and now we see the monster out there. We think that's the cause of our fear when we're really afraid of what the course at one point calls the murderer within us. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that everyone is tracking with us. So the course agrees that we are living in a state of fear. We feel that. And, and the course is echoing that idea. Yes, we are constantly living in fear. Although we minimize it and don't realize how much we're living in fear. Right. So we, we're afraid of everything, basically. And we try and deal with our fear by defending ourselves against it through um, pumping ourselves up, trying to master our fear becoming more empowered, numbing ourselves out, avoiding Dif our diffuse fear. the external threat. Yeah. So we know we're in fear. We try and deal with it in all these ways that just don't work because all we have to do is look around at the world and within ourselves to know that we're still afraid. So all the ways in which we try and deal with our fear aren't working. We think that the cause of our fear is coming from outside of us. The world is giving us all of these reasons to be afraid. But what the Course is saying is that the actual cause of our fear is we're afraid of the attack in us. We're, right. we're afraid that there, there's um, like we're hateful we're attacking others and that makes us afraid. Now, when we talked earlier about the course offering a message on fear that is, that is difficult to take in, this is it. This is the heart of it because what we were expecting in the fear workshop and what we got was various forms of pushback on that idea. Well, what about a child who who was afraid? Surely they're not afraid of their own attack thoughts. I've been diagnosed with this debilitating disease. Surely that didn't come from my attack thoughts, etc. So what would you say to someone who is trying to take in this idea, but is just not, not buying it yet? Yeah. Well, the idea we're putting forth right now is not that the attack in you is causing that stuff out there, that's a whole other topic in the course, but that the attack in you produces a perception that the things out there are real threats to you with power to really hurt you. So if you had no attack in you and you faced the exact same circumstances, the course said it wouldn't occur to you to fear them. They'd still be there. And they might be people trying to, you know, mess up your life, but you wouldn't see them as real threats and therefore wouldn't feel fear in the face of them. So the course is saying, you know, it's, it's just that the attack in you gives you a picture of the world through projection, that there's so much to fear out there because you're really afraid of that attack in you. And then, then I think there are ways to realize that we are afraid of the attack in us. Nobody wants to claim, you know, one of the things we said in, in the workshop is if someone says to you, you know what, you just attacked me and I know it was intentional and I know you meant it to hurt. How many of us will say, well, okay, you're right. <laughs> like 99% of people are going to say no. Um, and why do we defend against that so strongly? We don't like the idea of there being an attacker in us who attacks unprovoked, who attacks just because that's its nature, right? It wants to hurt. Um, there are all kinds of ways to see that that's what that would scare us. It's a wild idea to think that the reason why we're afraid 
no matter what we think we're afraid of, is that we're afraid of the attack in us. And it's one of those concepts that is just probably not going to punch through in a one hour podcast on this idea. You really have to let it in and chew Mm -hmm. on it and, and explore it for a while. But one thing I will say about this, and we'll get into to more as we go along, if the source of your fear is always outside of you, then you can never really control your fear because you can't control things that are outside of you. But if you understand that the source of your fear is within you, it's the the, the thing that you're afraid of is your attack, then you can start to gain some real control over it and not be so afraid. Yeah. And that's a really good point because if the threats are out there, then no matter how empowered you think you are, you're not going to be equal to all the threats, right? You got, you can get hit by a car. You can get your reputation destroyed unfairly. You can catch a deadly disease from somebody. Someday you're going to die. It's like, you are never going to be equal to all those threats out there. What we're talking about here is at least the promise of a total solution. There's a great line that I brought up in the workshop, uh, which is from chapter six in the course, and it says, safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. And I remember first reading that and thinking, I don't know if I understand it, but intuitively something in me does. Somewhere inside that makes sense. Safety is the complete relinquishment of attack. I think we can imagine that if we were completely without attack, we wouldn't feel so afraid all the time. And I think we also can sense that the complete relinquishment of attack is a possibility. It's possible to become totally innocent and harmless. So many course students know the line, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. We understand, we, we know that line and we understand the beauty of it. But when it comes to the practice of it, then we get afraid. We're afraid that in my defenselessness, I'm going to get run over. Uh, I'm going to become a doormat, et cetera. So what would you say to someone who's trying to let this in, but is concerned that it's actually their defenses that keeps them safe and not the other way around? There's a lot of discussion of this in the course. That's a good question. Uh, What the course says is that, first of all, our defenses affirm that we must be weak and vulnerable, or we wouldn't need defenses. It talks about us walking through the world Um, it says, uh, as God created you, you are unassailable. So it's a paraphrase, but the idea is that this is from that same lesson that we were created unassailable. So we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to defend. Um, we can walk around with a kind of security that nothing can touch. Um, at the same time, one thing I brought up in the workshop, which I think is an important, Uh, observation is that people who are truly spiritually advanced, even if they are extremely gentle and just loving, they can't be controlled. And you and I have talked recently about Peace Pilgrim, and we watched that documentary. It's kind of impossible to imagine controlling her. And yet she was incredibly mild and gentle and loving. So we're not saying, let everybody push you around and control you. But we are saying that if you were to completely relinquish attack and replace it with love, you might feel a security and sense of safety that you can't dream of now. So just getting deeper into why we attack, the course goes on to say that the attack in us is afraid of love. So why don't you unpack that for us a bit? Yeah, what was happening is I went through all those quotes, which was a great exercise to do. I mean, I'm so glad I did it. I wish I'd sort of had more time to, to, to do it. But I noticed that quote after quote talked about us being afraid of the attack, the hatred, basically the ego, 
in us. But as I was forming that view, I noticed an equally large number of quotes talking about us being afraid of the light, being afraid of God, not as punisher, but as love, being afraid of joy, uh, being afraid of our true nature, which is pure light and love. And I thought, okay, so how does that relate? And what became clear to me was that it's, it's the attack in us, the ego in us, that is afraid of light, of God's love, of joy, of our true nature. And so that made sense. Like if you identify, let's just say that you really want love and union and all these things, but you identify with something in you that wants to attack and you think that's me right? That's my nature. That's my identity. If you identify with that, then things that are opposite to that will feel like existential threats to your very being. Okay. So if you identify with the attack in you, then real love and joining, etc., being the opposite of attack, they're going to feel like they threaten what you are, threaten your very being. And so all of that made sense to me. And it, it makes sense of, I think, all that talk in the course, which as course students we've read, like we're afraid of love. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. why are you afraid of love? You wouldn't be afraid of love unless you had identified with something that was anti-love. And once you identify with something, you will protect it. And if love is a, is a threat to it, you will protect it against love. That's why everyone loves that Marianne Williamson quote so much about our deepest fear that it's it's not our darkness but it's our light that we're afraid of and it's a it's a really fascinating idea because on the surface we want to say why on earth would I be afraid of love mm -hmm. I I want more love in my life that's the reason why I'm on the spiritual path but then we look at all the ways in which we push love away. Mm -hmm. And if we are really keeping our eyes open, we can see we do that all day long. And so even though we claim to want to draw in more love in our lives, there is something in us that's constant. The ego in us is constantly on the attack. And we should also be clear. We're not talking about self attack here. Um, we're right. talking about the ways in which we are attacking others. And by attack, just if anyone's new to the course, attack can mean a lot of things. It doesn't mean that you are actually physically attacking someone. It means that you are avoiding them, withdrawing from them, being short or sharp or snappy with them. And again, if we're paying attention, we can see that we do this all day long. So for anyone who's thinking, I'm not trying to. I'm not afraid of love. Well, look at what look at how we behave all day because our behaviors tend to to say otherwise. Yeah, and it might we might think, well, I if I am afraid of love, I'm afraid of getting hurt. Right? It's a rational fear. And what the course would say is, well, maybe you've got that fear, but deeper down, you're afraid of the real thing because you've identified with the ego in you, the attack in you, and you think that Love being the opposite of that actually poses a threat to who you are. Yeah. And along that line, we should probably mention that so often when we talk about the, uh, the ego in us and its essential nature of attack, we start with attack. The course starts with attack. Like we, there is something in us that just wants to attack. And yet so often what we hear from students is I only attack because I'm hurt. I wouldn't attack if I wasn't hurt. And so yeah. do you want to say anything about the, the, the starting point of attack versus the starting point of hurt, which is where so many of us tend to, to go? There's so much to say about that. I will say that I just, I mean, I ended up collecting pages of quotes that talk about our fear coming from our attack. Um, like a couple of quotes right here from the text, but the saying know that only attack could produce fear. And then a chapter later, only attack produces fear. 
So the course, its philosophy is that it starts with attack. And I think the notion is that there's a kind of principle in our minds of psychological justice, where it's because we attack, we give attack, that we experience ourselves receiving attack. Um, the Course says, as you give, you will receive. So whatever we give out, we'll feel like we're on the receiving end of. Well, fear is the emotion you experience when you feel like you're on the receiving end of attack. The Course is saying you would never feel that way unless you had been on the giving end. So there's a certain kind of like a psychological justice or fairness to it. Um, but it is what the Course teaches. And what I feel in those comments is, I mean, it's very easy to see, I think, if, if the Course is right, those comments as evidence of how afraid we are of our attack. It's like, no, 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 I don't have any hate. I only attack myself. You know, I, I only attack I'm afraid. I've just been playing small. Anything but to say, there's an attacker in me. Earlier, I asked you a question about what did you learn personally from doing a word study of those 1600 references in the course to fear. And what you said to me, but you didn't mention earlier, is how much we have been willing to bargain with and dismiss and just allow the attack in us. Mm -hmm. And, and I think trying to start with hurt, like I only attacked because I was hurt is another way of avoiding and bargaining with the, sure. the attack sure. in us. Yeah. Because this, this also is true with the workshop we did recently on anger. It's the same kind of justification where it's like, I was only angry because I was provoked. I only attacked because I was afraid and, and hurt. And yet the course doesn't let us get off with that. The course really wants us to look at the ways in which we are causing our fear and our anger through our attack. And there are so many students who are like, why is the, the course trying to turn me into a bad person? I'm not a bad person. Why is it constantly getting me to look at these things? But what you realize is that when you look at them, once again, you have the power to change them. When you don't look at them, you don't have the power to right. and then you wonder why your life is constantly the same and why you know so many of us feel like victims of the world you don't have to you know right but like you're saying as long as you won't look you've made a deal where the attack in you like an engine can keep turning and keep turning and keep turning keep cranking out effects and as long as you say that's not in me don't tell me that's in me it's gonna keep going and you're going to keep having those effects. And so if you just take ownership of the attack in you and say, I don't want to do that again, I don't want to do that anymore, you can remove what is a major block to the awareness of love's presence and be more loving in the world and have more love come back to you as a result. So, yeah. okay. So I feel like we've already touched on this, but the course does say that fear is never justified. So do you want to say anything more about that idea? Well, I think we should, we probably can't emphasize that enough. It's not caused in us involuntarily by outside events. We choose it through the picture of reality that we choose. And that picture, if it's inducing fear, will always be wrong. We don't have to feel afraid. The right picture of reality and of any situation in specifically is one that leaves us free of fear. And the idea that we could be free just by choosing a different picture of reality, it's an incredibly liberating idea because we walk around afraid and no one likes it. To think that we could be free is amazing. And the big example of that that we shared in the workshop is Jesus. He went up to his own crucifixion without being afraid. And certainly the course isn't asking us to do that, but it is certainly saying that we have the potential to. I mean, imagine facing the most brutal situation and, and you are not afraid because you have a different view of reality. So we should probably get into to what that is. Um, yeah, the, the yeah. course 
has its own ideas that dispel fear. So when you walk through life holding these ideas, um, then you you are apt to be less afraid. So let's start start with number one. There's three of them. Yeah. And number one is God's love and care. So when you walk through the world, knowing that you are loved and cared for by God, you have less reason to be afraid. So that's a really big one. I mean, every idea that the course teaches that's real is fear dispelling, but these three that we're going to talk about were the ones that just came up again and again and again in relation to fear. So for instance, one of the quotes is that you can indeed afford to laugh at fear thoughts, remembering that God goes with you wherever you go. So if you really believe God's with you and he's really, he really is, is there loving you, taking care of you, if you'll let him, then you can laugh at fear thoughts. So this is a huge topic in itself, but let's just sort of, you know, mention it briefly by saying that this is a major solution to our fears to remember that God is real. He's here. He loves us. He cares for us. And along that line, we, God so loved us that he created us perfect. We are forever sinless and invulnerable. So no matter what the, the world throws at us, um, we can be free of fear if we get this idea as well. So do you want to expand on it? Yeah, the idea, part of the idea is he created us, as I said earlier, unassailable, meaning invulnerable. And so what that means is whatever the world throws at us, it can't, it can hurt our body. It can hurt our finances, but it can't really hurt us who we are. So that can help us be free of fear. Also, the course says God created us sinless, holy, pure. And if that's the case, then we don't need to be afraid of the attack in us, right? It, that attack in us seems to turn us into a sinner, turn us into a monster, right? But the Course says that it has no power to do that because God created us eternally sinless. We can, we can look at the attack in us without fear because that's not who we are. That's just such a beautiful idea. And if we really let it in, if we really understood that, we wouldn't be afraid. You know, the, I mentioned Jesus going to his crucifixion, not being afraid a minute ago. And I'm just imagining people listening, thinking, number one, how is that possible? And number two, I don't want that for myself. How could he possibly do that? And yet, if you get these ideas, God is unconditionally loving and caring for us right now, that God created our true nature as inviolate, inviolate and um, invulnerable and forever sinless and eternal, then we wouldn't be so concerned with what happens to these bodies. And imagine we were not, again, we're not going to face the same situation that Jesus faced, but at the same time, so many of us are facing debilitating illnesses, as I mentioned earlier. And what if we, what if we could walk through the illness thinking, you know what, no matter what happens to my body, my true nature is always safe. And yeah. how differently would we go through it if we could really hold that, not just as a yeah. platitude, but something we truly embody? Oh, yeah. I mean, it may not be easy to. But if we could, one could imagine being unafraid in the face of a terminal disease. So the third and final um, idea from the course that dispels fear that we're going to talk about today is the reality of love. Yeah, I mean, love and fear together are a huge topic in the course. The course is constantly mentioning them as opposites. In the very introduction, it says the opposite of love is fear, but what is all encompassing, meaning love, can have no opposite. So if love and fear are opposites and love is everything, is all encompassing, then fear must be nothing. And what that means is if we can let love fully into our minds, then as the Course says, and as the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. If we have a, a mind full of perfect love, then we can't have any fear. And this is where we get to this really important passage in chapter two in the text, where he basically says, don't try to solve your fear by the mastery of fear. 
he says, it asserts the power of fear by the simple assumption that it need be mastered at all. Then goes on to say, the essential resolution rests entirely on the mastery of love. So the mastery of fear means overcoming, overpowering your fear. You know, The mastery of love means becoming highly proficient in love. And the notion of becoming a master of love as the solution to our fears, I think that speaks deeply to us. It is sort of the opposite of overcoming fear by becoming so powerful that you can handle any threat, right? It's another direction that it looks in, but there's something that feels deeply right about looking in that direction. Yeah, this is an amazing course teaching. And there's two things going on there. Like you were talking about how the course constantly refers to love and fear and love is the only thing that's real. Therefore, fear can't be real. And I just want to expand on that idea too, because it's another one. The danger of this podcast is that we just drop these incredible course teachings, these concepts, and then move on really quickly because of time constraints. But at the same time, I love that idea. I think that if, again, if we really embodied it, then we wouldn't be afraid and we would have different lives as a result that the only thing real is love. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Love is real. Therefore, love cannot be threatened. Fear is unreal. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Herein lies the peace of God. Like, wow, I mean, we, we could wake up and as we're bombarded with those fears throughout the day, we can say, this isn't, this doesn't exist. This, this isn't real. And it doesn't mean that we don't take the actions that we need to take to live in this world. It just means that we, we can view them differently and behave differently as a result right. and call in different experiences as a result. Because so much of what we're afraid of comes from the way that we behave. <laughs> You know, we keep mm -hmm. talking about this. We attack and then we're afraid that other people are going to attack us. Those chickens are going to come home to roost. And so we're even more afraid. It's this really damaging cycle. And mm -hmm. it and the net effect of it is that it causes us to be more afraid. What if we just got out of that game altogether? Yeah. yeah. And part well, of we being, could. Part of being out of that game, as you're saying, is the mastery of love, because right. we keep going back to, and we just did a podcast on this recently, we keep going back to this idea of what journey are you on? Are you here on a physical journey, just going through life, trying to acquire things to make your body more comfortable? Or are you here on a spiritual journey where you're trying to learn the lessons of love and healing that you need to learn to go home to God? And we tend to think that if we get the physical journey right, the spiritual journey will take care of itself when actually it's the other way around. We get the spiritual journey right and the physical will take care of itself. And getting the spiritual journey right is becoming a master of love. It's learning to love in the face of attack. It's learning to not attack ourselves. Um, and, and that's what we're being called to do here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the course gives us practical tools for doing exactly that. So, you know, in the workshop, we ended with these six, with these six steps for dispelling fear. And I think I can get through them pretty, pretty quickly here. I know we're running out of time. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was me trying to boil down counsel the course gives all over in different places, but that's reflected in what it calls in chapter one, the correction formula for fear. Well, it, it appears in chapter one, it's called that later on. So step number one, be vigilant for fear. We need to watch out for it and not just let it pass across our field of vision all the time. And then step number two is when we see it, we need to know this is fear. He says the first step is always to know that this is fear. And just saying that to yourself, I know this is fear. I may have called it anxiety. I may have called it nervousness. But saying I know this is fear has an effect. It's a refreshing quality of facing it as fear. Number three is take full responsibility. Now, we want to think, some outside event is responsible for us being afraid, 
or maybe something in our past is responsible for us being afraid. But the Course says we are fully responsible because we chose the interpretation, the view of this situation. And that view is what's making us afraid. And again, I find there's something empowering and refreshing about saying, I am fully responsible for this fear. Number four is interesting, and it's look calmly at the cause. Now, I don't think we have to always do some you know, deep dive into what's the real cause here. From the course's standpoint, the cause is always some erroneous belief that is the cause of our fear. And so it might be, for instance, our belief that the person in front of us is unworthy of love because they're so dangerous. It might be our denial that God is with us now. It might be our belief that we are not God's perfect son, sinless and invulnerable. But the Course wants us to kind of be aware that it is a belief in us and look at it calmly, even if it maybe might scare us a bit because it contains attack, we can still afford to look calmly. Number five is choose truth, which is also love, instead. So we've realized that the, the fear comes from a belief, and now we choose to replace that with a true belief. And the Course constantly has us do exercises where we repeat some line that is the truth and is meant to come in and dispel our fear-producing thought, like fear is not justified in any form, or I need no defense because I was created unassailable, or God is the strength in which I trust. The workbook's full of exercises just like that. And then finally, number six, ask for help. Um, we're not asking Jesus to come in and just remove our feeling of fear. We're asking for his help with step number five, choosing truth instead. You know, on our own, we feel kind of weak in doing that. So if we can call in his help, we can be strengthened. Um, so one form we might use for doing that is saying, Jesus, I deny the power of the fear and turn to you. Help me to replace my fear with love. So very quickly, be vigilant for fear, number one. Two, know this is fear. Three, take full responsibility. Four, look calmly at the cause. Five, choose truth, love instead. And six, ask for help. It's so good. It's just so good. I, I'm really struck by the list and what the course has to say about dispelling our fear. I'm also struck by the work it took to put together <laughs> these steps. And I'm also really struck by the idea that we can follow these steps in order. You know, we, there would be a lot of benefit in saying, okay, I'm going to be vigilant against my fear. When it comes up, I know that I'm feeling fear. I'm going to take responsibility for the fact that I'm feeling fear. I'm going to look calmly at it. I'm going to choose truth and love instead of succumbing to this fear. And if I find myself stuck, I'm going to ask for help. And I'm, and I'm I actually don't even have to ask for help when I'm stuck. I can always ask for help because we can always be more loving. It's, it's a beautiful flow, but at the same time, we also can pick and choose whichever of these steps that it would be most beneficial to us in any moment. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put these six steps in the show notes for this episode. If you want to download a copy of them, they're designed as a one pager. So you can print them out and have them on your desk or somewhere close as a reminder. Just go to circleofa.org forward slash podcast and look for this episode on the way out of fear. And you'll find the, the PDF there. Robert, I know that you have to run. So is there anything that you want to say to give us some final thoughts on this episode on fear? I think the main thing is there is a way out, but it takes a lot of mind training. And if we're lax, I've been too lax, right? Then we don't find the way out. We have to devote ourselves to the mind training to the goal of the mastery of love. And we can get there. It's just that we have to really apply ourselves.
Yeah. And along that line, it, it, we understand that the course is teaching that our fear is caused by the attack in us is, is difficult for, for some of us to take in, but you don't even have to take in that message straight to get the benefit of what the course is trying to say on fear. If you just think, I don't have a reason to be afraid. I'm trying to externalize the source of my fear so I can recognize that it's really in me. And then from there say, I don't want this anymore. And the way to get out of it is to be a master of love, to really, like, you don't have to think as much about the attack in you if that's a too difficult of a message, you can think, I want to go through life being a master of love. What does that look like? And how will I embody that message? And that's just a, if you just do that, you you can make real shifts in relation to fear. And what a beautiful goal. Amen. Thank you, Robert. And thank you to those of you who are joining us live for our podcast recording. If you are listening and you want to sign up for podcast recordings live, you can go to circleofa.org forward slash events. You can find the link there. It is free. And uh, we hope to see you here at a recording in the future. On behalf of Robert and I and everyone here at The Circle, thank you so much for listening. Bye for now.